Welcome to our 2022 LabRoots webinar series. My name is Tara Nilees, Regional Marketing Development Manager for Life Science Electron Microscopy from Thermo Fisher Scientific and your host today. We welcome back our returning attendees and send a big hello to our new attendees wherever you are in the world. We are pleased to have two very engaging speakers lined up for our session today. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. Now, please let me introduce today's speaker. Christian Waddell is a Product Marketing Manager for Thermo Fisher Scientific's cryoelectron microscopy business. He studied molecular biotechnology at the University of Heidelberg and obtained a PhD in neurosciences from Göttingen University. Over the last 10 years, he has held sales, business development, and product marketing roles in light microscopy, correlative light and electron microscopy, large volume EM, and cryo EM. Now, Christian, over to you for your presentation. Welcome everybody to this Umeo University and Thermo Fisher Scientific webinar. And thank you, Tara, for introducing me. We're very excited to have Dr. Selma Daman as our guest speaker today, as her work demonstrates the power of cryoelectron tomography for virus research. I have chosen this image, which you will learn much more about later, as a teaser, because it encapsulates, in a nutshell, the beauty of cryo-ET. It also illustrates something Werner Kuhlbrand from the MPI in Frankfurt wrote in a very recent review, where he said, Every cell contains a universe of molecular landscapes that is best explored by cryo-ET. For those of you who are less familiar with cryo-electron tomography, I prepared a very short summary of the critical steps in that workflow. These six steps in total can be segmented into three groups. And the first is all about the samples. Most commonly, these can be proteins, viruses, bacteria placed on TEM grids, or cells that are cultured on these grids. The next group of steps can be summarized as sample preparation. On the one hand, that's the rapid freezing to create a vitrified cryo sample using plunge freezing, for example. But it is also important to understand that the samples have to be electron transparent for imaging them in a transmission electron microscope. Cultured cells are too thick to see anything in the TEM except for the very periphery of the cell. So they have to be thinned down. This is being done using a cryo-focused INB microscope, or cryofib for short, illustrated here on the right. Depending on the sample under investigation, it might also be necessary to target specific cells or locations within the cell using correlative light and electron microscopy, cryoclim in this case, which is shown here in the middle. The sample is then transferred to a cryo-TM like the cryos shown here, Tomography is being performed by tilting the sample multiple times to then reconstruct the tomogram from the recorded projection images. Further analysis and segmentation then ultimately yield visualizations like the one I showed you at the beginning of my introduction or the one being shown here. Most important are, of course, the results that can be obtained using cryo-ET. It's a technique that has grown significantly, both methodologically and with respect to the scientific output in fields like cell biology, neuroscience, and microbiology. I have picked some visually striking examples here, like the Golgi on the left and ER membranes with plenty of ribosomes at the top. There's an excitatory synapse from cultured hippocampal neurons on the right and phage assembly in a bacterial cell on the bottom. These are myriad examples but the scientific questions being addressed by the researchers behind these images go much deeper, obviously. If you want to learn more about the example shown here, please go to thermofisher.com slash cryo minus tomography, where you can find videos about the workflow itself, but also an ebook with very detailed descriptions about the data that I show here on the slide. I would now like to draw your attention once more to the example image in the lower right corner because it falls broadly into the category of research that is the topic for today, namely pathogen-host interactions. The motivation for using cryo-ET in these studies is to observe pathogens as close as possible to their native state inside a host cell. 
depending on the pathogen and sample preparation. This might mean that the cryo-EM instruments have to be installed in a biosafety facility. I think this is a good moment to show you a one-minute video of such a facility, the one we set up ourselves in Brno in the Czech Republic, because it gives you an idea of what a cryo-EM facility looks like and what our microscopes look like as well, instead of showing illustrations and results only. As mentioned in that video, our lab is a BSL-2 facility, but this year we have also announced that we can offer a 60 degree heating decontamination solution for the cryos. It combines heaters, temperature sensors, and software with HEPA filters, a secondary workstation so that the microscope can be controlled from both the inside and the outside of the biosafety area, and remote diagnostics. This enables the installation in a BSL-3 facility and work on pathogens susceptible to 60 degree heat. If you're interested in this possibility, please have a look at thermofisher.com slash cryo minus EM minus biosafety. With this very brief introduction into the cryo-ET workflow, the instruments involved and where they can be installed, I want to introduce you to our speaker for today, Dr. Selma Daman, who will talk about how she uses cryo-ET to study enterovirus assembly and release. Selma did her bachelor and master studies in the field of cellular and structural biology and then obtained her PhD in Montpellier, France, where she studied the interaction of viruses with the host cell plasma membrane and developed correlative atomic force and super resolution fluorescent microscopy in order to do so. Currently, she is a postdoc in Lars Anders Carlsen's lab in the Department of Medical Biochemistry and Biophysics at Umeå University. Selma. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are very excited to have you here. I leave the stage to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Christian, for the kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here today and show you the work we've done using cryo-electron tomography to study enterovirus replication in the cells. And I will start this presentation by giving a brief introduction on this family of viruses we work with in the lab. So two things you need to know about enteroviruses is the fact that they are non-enveloped and positive single-strand RNA viruses. They have uh, this, um, as, as you can see on this uh, EM micrograph, uh, they have this nice icosahedral capsid shell that is about 30 nanometer. They're extremely small, very contagious, and responsible for a wide variety of diseases ranging from common cold to more severe diseases such as heart inflammation and poliomyelitis. These two viruses are actually the two members of this family that we use as model viruses in the lab. They are both a BSL-2 uh, level pathogens. And today I will show you mainly the data I obtained on polio infected cells. Now, last point is the fact that these viruses, they have the ability to remodel cellular membrane to replicate. And in the case of poliovirus, it remodels the ER and Golgi membranes to form its own organelles. So in the, this case, they form these single, tubu single membranes, uh, these tubules in the cell, as well as double membrane vesicles. These membranes, we know that they are the site of their viral RNA replication, and they are often referred to the name of replication complexes. 
Now, uh, where virus assembly takes place is not known. Eventually, the new positive RNAs and proteins, they pack together to form new variants, which then leave the cell by uh, hijacking secretory autophagy inside these vesicles. Now, how a virus does this is not known, and whether this process is connected to particle formation is not known either. So basically, these are the two questions we try to answer using in situ cryo-electron tomography. So to do so, we uh, establish an optimized uh, workflow where we grow human cells on the EM grid, we infect them with the wild type virus, and at defined post-infection time, these cells are vitrified using vitrobots, for example, here. And uh, here, is, I just want to show you an intermediate step that allowed me to um, optimize the conditions like such as uh, virus and cell density in order to be sure that all the cells that grow on this EM grid are infected. And this is very important, especially if you don't have the possibility to use cryoclam prior to cryofocused ion beam milling, uh, because you want to make sure that the cell that you are milling is infected. So uh, cryofocus IMB milling, uh, as Christian mentioned it, is a sample preparation method that allows us to make the deep structures of the cell accessible to transmission electron microscopy. And now to show you just briefly how it works, uh, this is a frozen cell uh, seen by uh, the electron beam. So you have a top view of this cell. Now uh, down here is the same cell, but seen with the ion beam where you can see it from the side this time. So we use the ion beam here to trim away from above and below a part of the cell in order to obtain at the end of the milling process, a very thin slice of this cell. You can see this uh, thin slice now that it's, uh, its name is lamella. You can see it uh, here, uh, the top view of this lamella with the electron beam. And this is the lamella thickness distribution I obtained in this study. And typically you want to have very thin lamellas, especially if you are, are interested to use a subtomogram averaging. And this, uh, these lamellas are the ones that give you the best uh, tomogram with the highest resolution. However, in the beginning of a project, it's also useful to have thicker lamellas. These lamellas will give you more cellular context. And by this, I mean that you will have more information on how the virus or the pathogen that you are uh, working with is changing the interior of the cell. Now, of course, the final step is to uh, transfer the lamellas to the cryos. And here you can see an image of them under the TEM. So you see this lamella is uh, uh, nicely transparent to the electrons and already at low magnification, we can observe cellular structures. So these are the regions where I acquired tilt series to generate uh, at the end, a 3D volume of the, uh, the infected cytoplasm. So this is what I'm going to show you now. I will jump to the result parts in this slide where I want to show you two uh, representative tomograms of affected cells at the early time point and then at late stage of infection. So here is uh, to show you that uh, the replication complexes formed by, by the poliovirus at early time point, what we see mainly is single membranes. You can see vesicles as well as tubules. And close to this membrane, you can uh, um, recognize some virus particles here, these dark particles. And now at the late stage of infection, we start to see that there are double membrane vesicles as well with the single membranes. And we know that these structures here are hallmark of autophagy activation. Now I will let you appreciate the evolution of infection throughout the time where here you have uh, comp computational slices going back and forth within the 3D volume. So this is the kind of resolution we can get with cryo-electron tomography. And I will show you now in the next slides uh, the different uh, features, new findings that we could report using this method. So here is a snapshot of the tomogram I showed you in the previous slide. And this is a 3D segmentation of this area where the different structures that you can um, uh, visualize here are uh, color-coded. Um, now, what we could observe in all the tomograms of the infected cell is two different uh, assembly capsid states. 
we can see empty particles. Basically, they do not they do not contain the viral RNA. And we can see here RNA loaded variants, which are these uh, dark particles here. And strikingly, these capsids were tethered to the membrane at their vicinity. So you can see that it was the case for the single, but also to the autophagy membranes. And when we did the statistic, very interesting, we realized that this tethering happens mainly on the cytoplasmic phase of the membranes. Indeed, if you see this uh, variant, which get, got engulfed inside this uh, double membrane vesicle, it lost its tether. And this is a very important observation, which led us to question whether this tethering is helping the RNA on capsidation, because we know that this, uh, uh, the viral RNA replicates on uh, these membranes. So to verify this hypothesis, we used an antiviral drug, hydantoin, that has been shown to inhibit RNA on capsidation, even though you have poliocapsid particles forming in the cell. So we infected the cell, we treated them with the drug, and what we see in this case, very striking, is an abundance of empty particles in, this, uh, in the cytoplasm here. And the increase of empty particle formation correlated with the loss of the tether upon this treatment compared to untreated cell here. So this suggests uh, strongly that we have a tether that forms and help RNA incorporation in the capsid, and so the formation of a new infectious particle. And now I guess you wonder uh, where actually the viral capsids um, assemble in the cytoplasm. And as I mentioned before, it is one of the major open question in the field. So we looked carefully into the tomograms of the cells and we found that there are capsid assembly intermediates and docked on the single membranes, as you can see in this 3D segmentation. And these intermediates were also found on autophagy membranes and very rarely alone in the cytoplasm. And here is to show you that they have different conformation. You can see it in this uh, different snapshot, also different level of completion. However, we measured their uh, closure degree and we found that most of them corresponds to half uh, capsids. So uh, here now, I want to sum up this first part of the results. Uh, what we could report using in situ cryoity is that viral capsid assembly takes place on the replication complexes with the prominent half capsid intermediate. And uh, there is eventually a tether that helps RNA on capsidation during the assembly process. In the second part of the results, I want to show you how we unravel the roles of autophagy in virus replication. And uh, if, what we did is uh, we tried to find uh, host autophagy factors that support uh, virus assembly. In this case, we used a drug that inhibits VPS-34. This is a lipid kinase, very important in autophagy activation as uh, it's um, it helps the maturation and uh, formation of uh, uh, autophagy membranes. So we um, inhibited this uh, protein. And what we see in this case, very surprising, the virus is still able to activate autophagy. You can see it that uh, the, 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 the membranes, uh, phagophores and also double membrane vesicles are forming in the cell. However, very striking here, there are no more uh, uh, assembled variants in the cytoplasm. What we mainly observe are uh, capsid intermediates here, again, uh, docked on the membranes. So you can see it here uh, clearly on the phagophore, a single uh, membrane tubule or a double membrane vesicle here. And indeed, we calculated the number of complete particles, whether it's empty or RNA loaded variants, together with the capsid intermediate. And we see that upon this treatment, compared to untreated cell, we have a drastic decrease of uh, complete particles density. However, the density of capsid intermediate remained the same. So this means that upon uh, the inhibition of VPS-34, we have a virus assembly that goes to a point in forming this intermediate, but it does not go further. So we stole the virus assembly on the membrane. And I like very much this uh, snapshot where we could, uh, we, it, 
kind of quotes uh, a stage where uh, this intermediate is different from uh, this one, the health capsid, and close to the tethered particle I showed you earlier. So we like to think that this is kind of the evolution of assembly from the intermediate to a complete particle tethered to the membranes. Next, we did a very surprising uh, discovery. We found that the normal way of cells to activate autophagy limits virus replication. And we did that by using an inhibitor of the ALK complex. It's uh, a very, um, it's a, a combination of two protein kinases, uh, which are uh, the initiator of canonical autophagy. In this case, we see that the virus goes completely crazy. It forms these large arrays in the cytoplasm. Typically, in one array, we have more than 600 particles stuck on top of each other in this really beautiful crystal-like arrangement. And this was true for half of the cells treated with this drug compared to untreated cells. Now, it correlated, interestingly, with the increase of uh, the release of infectious particles from the cell, especially at this later time point when you, where you can see that there is one order of magnitude of increase of uh, particle release uh, from the cells. And this shows that unlike VKPS34 that has a proviral role in poliovirus infection, the ALK complex has an antiviral role and puts a break in virus uh, replication, uh, puts a break on virus replication. And now I just want to finish this talk by showing you how the autophagy membranes select and sort their contents. And here is an example of uh, phagophores as well as double membrane vesicles engulfing mature variants, as you can see here, as well as in this uh, 3D segmentation. And we could see sometimes empty capsids as well in the double membrane vesicles. However, when we did the statistic, we realized that even though we have empty capsids forming in the cytoplasm, only a subset of them ends up in the autophagy membranes. And this shows that we have a strong selectivity towards RNA-loaded variants where empty capsids are completely excluded from the autophagy membranes. And we like to think that this is a way of the virus to uh, leave the cell inside these physicals by uh, hijacking secretory autophagy. And now just uh, to show you how powerful is, the, is this method, especially if you're interested in autophagy, you can basically make a catalog of autophagy membranes, depending on what they contain, how the structures segregate in different classes or co-segregate in one class. And for instance, here we could often observe these uh, dense granules. They have these amorphous structures, uh, different from the viral particles. However, they were often co-packed together in the same autophagy membranes. And here I want you, I want to, uh, I want you to pay attention on this uh, very distinct class of autophagy membrane that contain these um, filament bundles, as you can see here in this autophagosome. And these filaments were rarely uh, packed together with the viral particles or the dense granules. We did subtomogram averaging to obtain an initial structure of these filaments. And we can see here that they have this very nice helical twist. They're about 10 nanometer. Now, the resolution that we got so far does not allow me today to tell you exactly what they are. However, what we've done is to uh, search in the EMDB host filament structures that could correspond to the filament we observe in this study. So we compare them to different filaments here, which makes sense with the virus, uh, virus infection context. And we uh, see that actually the decorated actin here, vinculin actin uh, structure, uh, fits the uh, structure of the filaments we observe um, engulfed in autophagy membranes. So we are investigating more into this, and I hope next time I will be able to tell you exactly what they are. So with this, I would like to sum up and uh, show you that using in situ cryoelectron tomography, we could report that enterovirus assembly happens on the replication membranes and that the VPS34 lipid kinase is important in this process. 
we see that there is a tethering of the newly synthesized capsids on the membranes, and this helps RNA loading. And we see as well that the autophagy membrane selects uh, uh, mature variants over empty cap capsids and that there are uh, filament bundles engulfed by the autophagy membranes in the infected cell. And finally, the uh, canonical autophagy is important to limit uh, virus replication. And in case of uh, inhibition, we see that uh, the uh, virus forms arrays and increases uh, uh, the virus particle uh, release. And with this, I would like to thank all the members of the lab and especially my supervisor, Lars Anders Carsten, our collaborators, uh, Nihal Altentoni and Adeline Carviel at NIH for the uh, virus uh, release uh, uh, assays, Justin Murado for his help in subtomogram averaging, and Michael Lazarou at Monash University for gifting us the knockout cells. Uh, the funding, as well as the uh, UCM, it's the uh, core facility where all these images were obtained. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you all with, uh, uh, for your attention, sorry, and I'm very happy to take your question if you have any. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Selma. These were really impactful results. It was fascinating to visualize how inhibition stalls viral assembly and uh, some, some really uh, interesting tidbits that we all picked up on there. Thank you. All right. So now we will start the uh, interactive part of our webinar and we will turn it over to questions and answers. Uh, we've got a couple of questions already rolling in here. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, then please do uh, enter them into the Q&A and hit send. And we'll be happy to answer as many questions as we can accommodate today. Okay. So the first question is for you, Selma. What made you choose cryo-ET as a technique? Or in other words, what, what are the advantages of doing in-situ tomography for you? Thank you, Tara. Yeah, um, so of course, it's the resolution that you can get with cryo-electron tomography. Uh, uh, yeah. Before, uh, there were uh, more images with some resin uh, embedded sections from infected cells which gave uh, a lot of good information on how these replication complexes look like in the infected cell. But the virus we are interested in is about 30 nanometers. It's quite small. So if we want to uh, catch its assembly, we need to have uh, a method that can, reach, uh, that can reach a resolution that will allow us to observe the different stages of the assembly, for instance, or macromolecular structures. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Great. And uh, another related uh, question is, uh, how much work was it to establish this workflow for your research? And is it routine for you now? Yeah, I'm happy to say that it's a routine now in the lab, definitely. But uh, uh, when I started this project, <laughs> so it's, 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 um, it depends. Because because me, I started from the scratch, so I didn't work with EM before, so I had to learn how to handle EM grids, which was very difficult in the beginning. So this is uh, really important. If you, have, if you have nice grids, flat grids, cells grow nicely on the grids, the feed milling, a plant freezing, feed milling goes perfectly. So uh, I would say uh, if someone is already, uh, already have an experience with the EM, can go faster. But otherwise, it took me almost one, uh, almost two years, one year and a half, because once you get used to with the, uh, all the different microscopes, get, get to learn how to work with, then um, it's much easier to play with your samples and try different things. Yeah. Right. Yeah, cool. for, for sure. The more that you spend time working on it, the more uh, easily uh, it becomes routine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. You need to spend a lot of time with the sample preparation. Of course, the cell density on the EM grid is very important to get a very thin eyes and yeah, and make sure that all the cells are infected as well. Yes, yeah, a lot of uh, crucial steps in the process that make or break right. your success. Yeah. 
Good, great, thank you. And uh, let's uh, let's have a question for Christian now. Um, Christian, from a methodological perspective, where do you expect to see significant improvements in the cryo ET workflow? Well, one one point for sure, resolution always. I think uh, what we're seeing nowadays is that cryo ET follows a little bit the path of single particle analysis, where we also saw significant improvements over time. So that's one resolution. Throughput is the other. So there's still plenty that can be done um, on the instrument level that would produce more data in shorter amounts of time. Um, and then, of course, much like single part analysis, I think on the computational level, analysis, um, automation there, improvements also to resolution on that level, I think there's still a lot of room to go beyond so that Selma can see which filaments uh, these are actually. Uh, that you found there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, technology is always uh, is always changing to meet the, the latest in demand. Thank you. And uh, Selma, another one for you. Um, for your research, uh, do you have ideas already on what you want to study next? Uh, do you have other pathogens that you'd want to work on? Uh, yes, I mean, at the moment uh, in the lab, we are uh, trying to uh, get more information on how another virus replicates in the cell, which is uh, also part of the enterovirus family. It's a coxic virus B3 and it infects uh, the cardiomyocytes. So we are working on that at the moment, yes. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, cool. It'll be it'll be nice to stay in touch and to see what the future holds together. Definitely, yes. Excellent, thank you. And maybe this one is for either of you. Um, let's see. The uh, the one thing I did not see in the video was the cryo preparative process on done in the BSL two environment, specifically freezing via plunge freezer or high pressure freezer. How are the aerosols handled? Maybe I can start and then Selma can correct me or, or add to how, how they are doing it in, um, in Umeo. Um, uh, generally speaking, of course, biosafety regulations are a local thing. So, you know, whatever I'm going to say now is very much based on what I've seen. It doesn't mean that it's globally true or universally true. Uh, for BSL2 environments, uh, from, from what I've saw, uh, seen is that um, sample preparation including plunge freezing is usually uh, limited to to rooms that are physically separate from the microscope uh, rooms. So uh, clear separation across the hallway, for example, rooms that are dedicated to just that, nothing else, and just to keep areas of, of higher concentration or higher pathogen, con hypothetical higher co concentration of pathogens separate from the microscope where uh, generally on a temp grid uh, uh, concentrations are much, much lower. Um, but no, no further uh, limitations. I've also seen, at least in one case, like an aquarium inside the lab, in a sense, so a, a physical separate area for sample preparation that was essentially a glass box installed within uh, uh, the microscopy lab that you could walk into. Uh, so in a sense, again, physical separation. Um, aerosol specifically, of course, is a, is a huge topic for BSL-3, um, and there from, um, everything that I've seen and heard is that usually plunge freezing devices are installed in biosafety cabinets, so directly inside. Uh, so it's an, uh, again, physically separated, of course, but then additionally placed in a biosafety cabinet. But that's from what I can tell uh, limited to BSL-3, this requirement. Uh, for high pressure freezing, I have to admit, um, I, I don't haven't seen a whole lot of them. I would assume that for BSL-2 it's the same as a plunge freezer. I have never seen a, a high pressure freezer in a VSL3 lab, and I, I doubt that you could install it inside of biosafety cabin. So there, I have to admit, I don't, I just don't know the answer. Thank you. Maybe Selma, you can add uh, to how how you're doing it, which I think is a BSL2 facility in your case. Yes, it is. Um, so uh, I mean, it's what you said uh, is uh, it. This is what we are doing. So we have a, a physical separation between the microscope and the plunge freezing room, the cryo room. Also, we um, so everybody is aware that it's the BSL2 sample preparation room. So 
you have to wear clothes, whatever you do in this room. And then you need to make sure that you follow the instruction for the pathogen you're working with. So it um, depends if you can um, decontaminate with ethanol or if you need uh, something more uh, stronger to kill them. Uh, so you would need to use that. Then we use a small plastic pad uh, uh, in, uh, on the vitro boat to protect the pads, the sponges, so that nobody like after the bloating, nothing goes through the filter paper and goes to the pad. So that we use that. Um, yes, and then we make sure that we decontaminate all the surfaces, the tweezers. So that's the routine. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that uh, that gives some insight into uh, a new environment that really has a tremendous amount of potential for the future, for hopefully many more scientists to uh, go down this path. Okay, um, next question. Beautiful talk and beautiful work. Um, any hypothesis on the mechanism by which BPS34 interferes with virus assembly? Thank you. Um, so we, we did uh, mini measurements uh, under this treatment, and we also checked if the viral RNA replication is ongoing. Um, so we see that there is a decrease by, compared to untreated cells, but it's not as significant uh, compared to the decrease of virus particle assembly. Um, so there is something going on with virus assembly, and we don't know yet exactly. Uh, definitely, we have less membranes. So let's say that uh, most of the cells did not um, make uh, as much as membranes uh, replication complexes as compared to treated and treated cells. So it's only in the cells where they still uh, manage to uh, activate autophagy and have membranes that we could see these intermediates. So it could be that uh, the, uh, it's also involved in the formation of the replication complexes, and so it's, um, the site of the virus assembly is not um, is uh, available uh, is not available under this treatment as much as uh, in untreated cells. So there are many hypotheses, but uh, it's difficult to say. It. Perfect. Thank you. No, All right. Uh, lots of uh, lots of great questions here uh, and great comments too. Uh, great talk. Does your data show where the dsRNA intermediate is? So um, no, um, it's it's difficult to say. If, uh, so we have some uh, structures uh, inside the membranes and also the similar densities outside in the cytoplasm. So it's difficult to say if this is the um, double-stranded RNA. Um, the, 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 the cell, the cytoplasm is so crowded that it's really difficult to say the pinpoint and say that this is the, uh, the double strand RNA. So uh, after the, the paper with the feed milling on the um, uh, corona affected uh, cells, where we see this pore complex on the double membrane vesicles through the, uh, that allows uh, potentially the viral RNA to go from the replication complex to the cytoplasm. I don't see such a pore on the replication complexes of poliovirus. So the only protein that can make pores on the membranes is a viral porin, and it's a 20 kilo Dalton, so it's really small. If there is, if there are pores in the membranes, I wouldn't be able to see them anyway. So yeah, the answer to the question just short. Uh, no, I cannot say if we can see. It's probably there, but I can't say where it is. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a, this is a good question. Uh, hi, and thanks for your nice presentation. Can you tell me how many tomograms did you select for subtomogram averaging? So yeah, we had to do a very stringent uh, selection. Um, so we took the best tomograms, like the best ones, also in terms of alignment, because we use. Um, uh, patch tracking, we have no fiducial and some lamella, so you, you end up with a few tomograms at the end. So I had 16 tomograms, uh, 
the uptick seen tomograms for the subtomogram averaging. Then we use the fiber tracing um, uh, module on Amira. So I first traced the filaments, and then we took this coordinate to Dynamo for uh, making solid volumes and um, the averaging. Yeah, so 16. Great. A uh, great way of incorporating really the entire workflow and reconstruction um, with subtomogram averaging. Fantastic. Okay, a uh, couple more questions here. Um, congratulations on such beautiful work. I would like to ask you whether you are able to test the output of viable infectious viruses arising from the conditions you tested. Um, so, I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, I think the question maybe is, um, are you able to test the output of infectious viruses arising from the condition? Oh, yeah, I understand that the, uh, the confusion because, of course, these are cryo um, if, if the viruses can do, um, if they can be still infectious, uh, they are. Um, if this is the question, uh, so these uh, vi viruses, the ones that uh, are formed inside the cell, are viruses that are released um, at some point, and they are infectious. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, maybe Christian, if you'd like to uh, to jump in, um, this is uh, another question, or, or either one of you can answer. Um, can mitochondria be visualized uh, via this method? Uh, yes, would be my answer. Yeah, you can see them definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Beautifully, in fact. Great. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, let's see. Um, another question is: Can you see some physical properties of the vesicles uh, comparing to other techniques um, like AFM? Um, it would be difficult because here what we have is a snapshot. So we um, the only thing that we can measure is the volume the, of the double membrane physical, the size. And yeah, it's not possible to have information on how they are more physical information than this. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I don't know if the person is thinking about a specific uh, property, but I would say that's what you can get, the volume. And still, you need to keep in mind that we are feed milling, so uh, it happens often that we don't have the whole 3D volume of the vesicle. So um, it's, the more you make tomograms, of course, more lamellas, you will have an idea what they uh, the similar what I've done here, that the, the different classes of autophagy membranes with different content, it's because I have several tomograms on, on the same condition and I can make statistics, but otherwise uh, it's snapshots, so no dynamic, no physical property. More than that. So. Thank you. Okay. And we're, we're getting down to the last uh, couple of questions, so I'll just remind our attendees, if you'd like to uh, ask any final questions, please do so. Um, I've got another request for a comment here. Um, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Uh, the comment is about the particles assembly assembled in arrays. The conclusion was that secretion of the particles increased, but didn't the transfer into the membrane vesicles get interrupted? and the particles need to be inside for secretion. Is, is this correct? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I didn't show it in the in this presentation, but uh, you, you can see, we can see, we report also that uh, the secretion of viruses in um, and the uh, vesicles is also increased in this case with this uh, treatment. Uh, 
Um, now, uh, the assay, virus uh, release assay, was done on the SuperNet, and so we don't know exactly if uh, the, um, the increase of infectivity is due to these arrays or the physicals together. So it's difficult to um, separate between the two. Whether these arrays are infectious, do they uh, lyse the cell and they explode and then they can propagate? It's, uh, uh, it's, it's an open question, but I think we, are, we can do something. We can we measure the membrane integrity and see if uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an increase of uh, cell permeability due to these arrays because it resembles to the lytic version of some viruses, for instance, adenoviruses, they form this kind of array. I hope I answered the question. Thank you. Um, and this, is a, this is a great question uh, for, for either of you. Again, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, these lamellae are very fragile, and you mentioned you have the best data from the very thin ones. Can you estimate your success rate of lamella cutting, and do you have a trick to make them very thin? Should I answer, Christian, or do you? Okay, uh, I think I know Thomas. Hey, <laughs> uh, um, but uh, yes, yeah, it's uh, it's, um, it's a good question because uh, yeah, you need to always expect to uh, lose at least half of the lamella from the way. Um, uh, let's say um, I'm losing less lamellas now, but it's true that you take a risk, whether it's on the feed milling when you are at the last step of polishing where you try to have it thin, uh, a very thin lamella, and you can see that you are really risking to just cut in the middle and lose completely the lamella or during the transfer. Uh, I would say, yeah, half is really a lot, but yeah, something like that. Um, I usually, what I do is I have two sessions on uh, SIOS. Let's say in one session, I, I put two, three grids and I try to make four cells per grid. And so I end up with 12 lamella. And on cryos, I can find eight good, sometimes just six. So it's something like, roughly like this, yeah. And you need to also think about this, just not losing the, it can crack and then it's not stable enough to do uh, a tilt theory. And also you can have a contamination, unfortunately, exactly where you want to take a tilt theory. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Your expertise really shines through. Thank you for sharing with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. All right. Great. So um, this brings us to the conclusion of our Q&A. And uh, before we go, I'd like to share a little bit more information with you. Um, so uh, Christian mentioned the biosafety level labs, and uh, we showed a short video earlier in today's presentation. I'd like to uh, share the links with you so that you can explore a little bit more uh, detail. Please visit our website, um, as you see here, cryo-em-biosafety, to learn a little bit more of the specifics on how you can incorporate this into your facility as well. And also, um, I'd like to bring your attention to upcoming events. So we have had a successful day today, and we look forward to future successful sessions with LabRoots. And uh, you can find all of the upcoming events uh, here um, in the agenda, as well as any on-demand uh, past events you're able to access. Okay. And so, as we wrap up today, we'd like to send a very big thank you uh, to the audience for joining us today and really for the amazing and interesting questions. It is very clear, uh, Selma, that your presentation was so well received and really uh, very impactful uh, based on the great questions that you received. Uh, if there are any more questions that come in that we did not have time for today, we will reach out to you uh, with the contact information that you provided uh, at the time of registration. 
This webcast and others are found in the series uh, with a link that was provided, and we encourage you to share this session with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Certainly, if there are other uh, sessions that you'd like to see, uh, please visit the on-demand section of the event. You can also register for upcoming events. Uh, the next one that you'll find on the link is on April 27th with researchers at MRC LMB and their classification of tau pathies using cryo-EM. And you can find more about biosafety via the link provided, as well as additional tools on the Thermo Fisher website in the Cryo-EM Learning Center. I'd like to uh, give a very big thank you to our speakers, Selma and Christian, and all of our organizers, and especially to everybody who joined us today. We will see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.